I get asked a few similar questions often, and they're truly fantastic questions. They all start with something along the lines of, why don't they just? And then they're followed with what seems like a great idea, such as, why don't they just launch rockets from on top of mountains? So they're closer to space and they won't have as much air to fight against, and they can even use more vacuum efficient engines. I mean, think about how much fuel is wasted just to get up to say four kilometers in altitude how much smaller and more efficient could rockets be if they could start off much higher above sea level, above most of the atmosphere? Or another great one is, why don't they just launch rockets from the equator so the rocket gets to take full advantage of the Earth's rotation to help it get to orbit? Why aren't we taking full advantage of the planet we're living on? I mean, it's free energy, right? How much of a difference does launching rockets from different locations actually have? I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, and today we're going to dive into the physics of launching rockets from different places around the Earth. We'll go over the pros and the cons of launching from mountaintops or closer to the equator in great depth to see if we can figure out why exactly we just really don't see rockets launching from these locations all that often if at all. Here's the timestamps for these sections, which are also in the description here. The YouTube timeline is broken up into these sections. And of course, we have an article version of this video up at everydayastronaut.com for your reading pleasure. And while you're there, take a look at our awesome shop where you can find incredibly detailed 1100 scale metal Falcon 9 model rockets and lots of other really cool stuff at everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Okay, let's get started. Three, two, one, Right at the top here, I have to strongly, strongly suggest watching my video Orbit versus Suborbital because it lays down a lot of important groundwork that are vital concepts for this video. But if you already are familiar with Orbit versus Suborbit, where does space start and the Kármán line, Apogee versus Perigee, zero G and weightlessness, etc., etc then I think you're probably ready for this video. And quick little fun note, this is part one of two. In the next video, we're going to talk about why don't they just use other technologies alongside rocket engines to help make launches more efficient, like using jet engines or air launching, or even build massive catapults or maglevs and things like that to help throw rockets. So be sure and stay tuned. So that being said, let's start off with a great question. Why don't they just launch rockets from on top of mountains? Launching from a mountain. I mean, this one seems pretty obvious. Not only are you closer to space, the atmosphere is also much thinner on top of tall mountains, so you can actually utilize a more efficient, more vacuum optimized nozzle, and you'll actually have less air to fight against on ascent. By using a longer, larger nozzle, we gain efficiency from the engine, since the nozzle's job really is just to convert high pressure, hot, slow moving exhaust gas into lower pressure, lower temperature, faster moving exhaust gas which directly correlates to the engine's efficiency. But there is a limit to how big you can make a nozzle in the atmosphere. A larger nozzle can lower the pressure of the exhaust below ambient air pressure, especially at sea level, where ambient air pressure is at the thickest. And that can cause flow separation at the nozzle exit that can actually damage the engine. The difference between a sea level engine and a vacuum optimized engine is really obvious on the 3.7 meter wide Falcon 9 because you can fit nine sea level engines on the first stage, but you can only fit one vacuum optimized Merlin engine on the upper stage. So same engine, different nozzles, it shows you how big a difference that really is. Now the general rule of thumb is you can't have your nozzle exit exhaust be below about 40% that of the ambient air around it. So at sea level with one bar of pressure, the exhaust is rarely much below 0.4 bar at the exit of the nozzle to prevent flow separation. Okay, now that we have that out of the way and we understand the difference between a sea level and vacuum optimized engine, Let's make up a little situation where we might want to launch a rocket from on top of a mountain. Let's pretend we're ULA or United Launch Alliance. We're from the United States and we've got our headquarters in Colorado, pretty close to Denver. One day we decide, you know, we've got the beautiful Rocky Mountains right in our backyard. So why don't we just choose a new launch site for the Delta IV medium with no solid rocket boosters? Now, yes, I know that that rocket's retired, uh, so bear with me. It's, we're using it for a very particular reason. 
You'll see why here shortly. We decide we want to put a new launch pad up on top of Pike's Peak because it's pretty close to our workforce. It has a paved road all the way to the top and it's really quite tall at 4,302 meters. And believe it or not here, the atmosphere is already about 40% thinner than it is at sea level. This means we could increase our nozzle size on our first stage, which could offer a few percent better efficiency. Our new slightly larger nozzle can get 380 seconds of specific impulse at the launch site and 420 seconds in a vacuum versus the 360 seconds and the 412 seconds the standard RS-68A engine would normally achieve. And here's the fun part. This theoretically could have been possible on the Delta IV medium, which is why we chose it, because it only had a single engine with nothing else to really run into, no other engines next to it or anything like that. So the nozzle could have theoretically grown for these special mountain launch versions. Now the big question is though, what did it do? What's the actual performance gain of doing this? If the Delta IV medium with no solid rocket boosters launched from Kennedy Space Center, it could lift about 8.5 tons. So how would a Delta IV medium with this new you know, mountain launch version actually perform? Well, its payload capacity could go up about 1,000 kilograms to almost 9.5 tons. That's actually quite a healthy increase in capacity. But believe it or not, there's actually very, very little advantage in launching from a higher altitude in terms of it being closer to space. That modest gain of four kilometers compared to the hundreds of kilometers of altitude that the rocket will end up in just really isn't a lot in terms of percentage of the final altitude. Another thing that doesn't make a big dent is the velocity gained from launching from a higher altitude, since the velocity at the ground is roughly the same, regardless of where you launch from, either sea level or on top of a mountain. As those of you who watch my video on orbit versus suborbit know, even if you started in space, you'd still need to gain roughly 7,900 meters per second of velocity in order to actually get into orbit and therefore stay in space. So we see virtually all of these gains from the more efficient nozzle that we could utilize, which gives us additional delta V or change in velocity from the same amount of propellant because the nozzle is more efficient. So there's that. And then plus it's, you know, there's less air to fight against, but we really don't see any advantage from the actual starting altitudes distance to space, which is frankly negligible. But regardless, a one ton increase or what is that? That's more than a 10% increase. Sounds pretty amazing. You know, rocket scientists will go to some extreme measures for just a few percentage gains. So what's the holdup? Why don't we see rockets launching from Pike's Peak? Well, there's a couple things at play here, but perhaps the biggest showstopper is the location of this pad being inland where the rocket would have to overfly populated areas and personal property. This is generally a big no-no, at least here in the United States. The FAA does not love when a highly explosive rocket flies over populated areas, especially because even in normal nominal operations or nominal operations, a traditional rocket booster is simply dropped off and expended and it'll actually come crashing down just a few hundred kilometers downrange. Now, theoretically, you know, something like a Falcon 9 could just return to the launch site, but you're still having to fly over populated areas. So if something went wrong and they had to terminate the rocket, yeah, you're gonna have a uh, big, chunks of rocket debris falling down in, you know, the middle of Colorado Springs or something. And I just don't think that's a good idea. Now having a rocket or potentially having rocket parts falling from the sky isn't really a big deal when you're launching over the ocean where the spent booster can just simply crash into the ocean far away from any human population. And just to make sure there aren't any humans at risk of a booster crashing on their heads, the path is actually cleared of boats and planes before every single launch. That's right, they actually publish an exclusion zone downrange of where the rocket's going to fly. And they have to clear it out to make sure there's no boats or planes before every single launch. And they, you know, they publish it ahead of time so, you know, captains and pilots know not to go into this area. But occasionally, you know, someone didn't check it right or ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. And there'll be a wayward boat or a plane that comes right down into the range before the rocket's about to take off. And, you know, it'll end up totally scrubbing the rocket. They'll have to like shut it all down. And it's just one of the most frustrating and worst reasons for a scrub. Hold, hold, hold. Boarding the launch auto. It's launch director calling a hold. We have a red range for a fouled range with a ship in the hazard area. Now it simply wouldn't be possible to clear out an area for hundreds of kilometers downrange when launching inland from the United States. 
Now, unfortunately for some people living in remote villages in China, Russia, and Kazakhstan, they don't have the luxury of living in an area where a giant metal tube might not crash on them anytime a rocket launches. Another major complication is simply the logistics of getting both the rocket, but also the propellant and all the other stuff up the top of the mountain for each launch. And this isn't trivial. The road going up Pikes Peak is very windy with extremely tight turns and often hazardous weather conditions. So yeah, some of these conditions might actually be outside of the operational range of both the rocket and the crew. So in this particular example, unless the factory was basically right next to the launch pad, shipping a five meter wide Delta IV across the country by highway and then up a windy treacherous road up a mountain just really doesn't make sense. Shipping costs and logistics is why SpaceX designed the Falcon 9 to be the size that it is. Falcon 9 is exactly 12 feet wide or 3.65 meters wide, which is the maximum width you can ship something on US highways without getting into the super load category of oversized loads. But of course, the real reason why we don't see rockets launching on top of mountains is because it costs more money. <laughs> Potentially a lot more money. In a case like this, if there happened to be a payload that was more than 8.5 tons and we're ULA and we're sitting there going, uh-oh, we're Delta IV medium, can't do more than 8.5 tons. Instead of losing a customer, we could probably just upgrade them to a Delta IV medium plus with two solid rocket boosters. Which yes, that was a thing you can do. You could add two or four smaller solid rocket boosters to the side of the rocket. And at just $5 million a piece, or $10 million for the pair, you could increase the payload capacity to 12 metric tons. So a full 3,500 kilogram increase. So for the very few times where that one extra ton of payload capacity might find you a new customer, it'd simply not be worth the investment, the risk, and the increased cost of operations, when instead you could just simply attach two solid rocket boosters to your rocket, that would fit the needs of the customer. But here's something interesting. In our example, we actually lost a little bit of potential performance increase because of our launch location. No, I'm not talking about the altitude. I'm talking about the latitude. Pikes Peak is at 38.8 degrees north. So it's a good 10 degrees further north than Cape Canaveral. This means it's even further away from the equator. So the Earth's rotation doesn't offer as much of a boost as it would at lower latitudes. Okay, so this brings up a good point. Why don't they just launch rockets from the equator to take full advantage of the Earth's rotation? The Earth is spinning, quite quickly in fact. At the equator, the Earth's surface is moving at about 460 meters per second which is a fairly large chunk of the 7,900 meters per second needed to actually orbit the Earth. That's about 6% of orbital velocity. I mean, this seems like a no-brainer, free energy. And thanks to the relationship between your total delta V and your payload capacity, 460 meters per second of free velocity can actually drastically increase your payload capacity much beyond 6%. Well, it's obviously a pretty good idea, and that's actually exactly why the European Space Agency has been doing this since 1968. The French Guiana Space Center is a European spaceport located in South America in the French territory of French Guiana. It's very close to the equator, only about five degrees north of it. This allows rockets launching from there to take nearly full advantage of the Earth's rotation, and it offers a quite noticeable increase in payload capacity. But how much of an increase are we talking about here? Well, we can actually see the exact amount since nearly identical Soyuz 2.1 rockets launch from both the Guiana Space Center at that five degree north latitude and Baikonur Cosmodrome, which is located at about 46 degrees north. When launching from French Guiana, the Soyuz ST can take about 3,200 kilograms to a geostationary transfer orbit. When the nearly identical Soyuz 2.1A launches from Baikonur, it's limited to only about 2,000 kilograms to that same geostationary transfer orbit. That's 60% more payload capacity just by changing the launch site. And ESA isn't the only ones who were eyeing some free velocity from the Earth's rotation. A company called Sea Launch had a floating launch platform that, as the name implies, would launch rockets 
from the sea right on the equator. The rocket that launched from this sea platform called Ocean Odyssey was a Zenit 3SL. So a variant of the Zenit rocket featuring one of my all time favorite rocket engines, the RD-171, which is the most powerful liquid fueled rocket engine ever made. The rocket and the platform sailed 11 days, a pretty incredible 4,800 kilometer journey from Long Beach, California to the equator at 154 degrees west longitude in international waters. From here, the Zenit 3 SL could take 6,160 kilograms to geostationary transfer orbit, which again was a very healthy increase in capacity from its derivative, the Zenit 3 SLB, which could only take 3,750 kilograms to GTO from its launch site in the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. So again, it's about a 60% increase in capacity. Sea launch would fly the Zenit 3SL 38 times with the last launch in 2014. They would end up with an okay track record, having lost four of those 38 missions. Unfortunately, they closed up shop in 2014 as their services were largely considered unreliable and expensive. <laughs> but wait, they were able to launch 60% more payload using pretty much the exact same rocket why did they fail? Or for that matter, why doesn't every launch provider just ship their rockets to lower latitudes to get increased performance out of their rockets? Well, if we're now having to ship our rocket and in the case of sea launch, our rocket and our entire launch pad down to the equator, of course, that's going to cost money. And this cost won't be insignificant, likely in the millions of dollars in fuel, fleet, and personnel just to ship it there. Now, pretty much all launch pads have some considerable distances between the launch teams and headquarters. But the more remote it is, the more of a logistics issue it becomes to move teams around for every single launch campaign. But not only do these logistics apply to the personnel, it also applies to payloads and replacement parts and fuel and all that sort of stuff. So now you also have to fly and ship every single thing to these remote locations every single time there's a problem or a new part or something that needs to be replaced or added. I mean, imagine if there's a problem with the rocket and you actually had to send it back to the factory. That's gonna cost you. That's gonna cost you a lot. Now, if you're a company like ULA, again, as a perfect example, who's already shipping their rocket by barge, getting a rocket from Huntsville, Alabama to Cape Canaveral is already a 3,400 kilometer journey or all the way down around the, the Panama Canal to California. So you could theoretically imagine a world where it could be more advantageous or frankly more of an option for ULA to ship a rocket via you know the ocean to a launch complex closer to the equator compared to, again, let's say SpaceX and their highway shippable Falcon 9. But the reality is flying closer to the equator probably makes the biggest difference if your other option is landlocked to the east, such as everywhere in Europe, and or if your current launch pads are very far north, like those pads in Russia and Kazakhstan. Here in the United States, our primary launch pads are already fairly far south, at least compared to, you know, those in Russia and Kazakhstan. You know, the majority of our launches take place at Kennedy Space Center, and that's already at 28.5 degrees north, so that's decent. And then there's Wallops, Virginia, which is a little bit less frequently used. It's almost 38 degrees north. And then SpaceX's Starbase is at 26 degrees north. And this extra inertia from the Earth's rotation is mostly advantageous when you're launching into high energy orbits, like geostationary orbits or the rare equatorial orbit, which can technically only really be reached either from the equator or by doing an energy intense dogleg maneuver. Now, if you're launching into a polar orbit or a sun synchronous orbit or a retrograde orbit, launching closer to the equator is actually not an advantage because you actually have to fly retrograde to cancel out the rotation of the earth. So in these cases, it's actually advantageous to fly closer to the poles. So ironically, having a launch pad down at the equator could actually be a negative thing for certain missions. And that, my friends, is the art of compromise. And frankly, the location of launch pads often is primarily a matter of what land is actually just available, period. It's not always feasible to place a launch pad at the exact perfect location, maximized for performance, because it's got the highest altitude and the lowest latitude and blah, blah, blah. Sometimes it just simply comes down to simple land acquisition considerations. Oftentimes, launch complexes are on military bases or federal land. 
I mean, sure, there's a handful of private launch pads popping up now, especially in the last decade or two, but you often are limited to what's available or you know being offered to you, your company, or your organization. But there's pros and cons to all this stuff. There's always pros and cons. So to summarize, rockets are incredible feats of engineering and they're already pretty close to the edge of what's physically possible. So it only makes sense that we, you know, all kind of crave to try and find ways to help squeeze even more performance out of them, optimizing them as much as physically possible. But the problem all comes down to a couple simple words, practicality and compromises. <laughs> yes, on paper, pretty much everything we talked about in this video would indeed help a rocket do more work and potentially increase its performance dramatically. At the end of the day, there's always some deep trade that each engineering team goes through when designing a system. If option A is projected to cost, let's say $1 billion before you can start flying a customer's payload, and option B is projected to cost $2 billion, that's a gamble that you simply might not be able to take due to your available resources. Whenever I think of a question like this myself, where there's something along the lines of, why don't they just, I first usually tend to just kind of default to why does every team of engineers seem to wind up doing such similar things and coming to similar solutions so often. But honestly, in the future, who knows? If rocket launching to you know the moon and Mars and all these huge missions and we're launching a thousand times more than we are right now, these things might help, you know, 60% payload capacity might make a ton of sense. I mean, and don't forget SpaceX was looking at, you know, launching on sea launch platforms that could potentially be, you know, down near the equator. So you never know, maybe in the future, some of this stuff will be utilized, but for now, it's not so much. But what would you do if you were building a launch vehicle and a launch complex? Would you try and find a mountain near the equator next to the ocean? Or would you just take whatever's easily accessible, available and affordable? Let me know your thoughts and if you have any other questions about this stuff in the comments below. And don't forget, this was only part one of a two part video series. And in part two, we're going to dive into air launching or putting jet engines on rockets or giving them a boost from the ground with a slingshot or a maglev. This whole why don't they just thing keeps getting more exciting and more ridiculous. So be sure and stay tuned for part two. I owe a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters, our YouTube members and our Twitter subscribers. We offer some fun little perks like, you know, script read throughs and exclusive live streams, or you can get your name here if you're a Patreon supporter at the mission director tier. But uh, all these things just really go a long way. Or if you feel like it, drop a, a super thanks here on YouTube or give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. It all helps. And of course, while you're online, head over to everydayastronaut.com shop for things like this, our Aerospike shirt or our incredible Falcon 9 metal model rockets. I always say metal, but you need to like, it's not until you hear them and feel them and feel how heavy and, and detailed these things are in person that you realize just how amazing they are. We have lots of other cool stuff, including our dress wear, schematics collection, future Martian shirts, fun accessories like our heat shield color changing mug and tons of other cool stuff. And more stuff is coming along the way. Head on over to everydayastronaut.com shop. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to earth for everyday people.